I'm Sunny Kajavi, and at present I live in Shelton, Connecticut, and I joined the uh, church, I believe it was in 1987. And I'm Sherry Brennan, I live in Norwalk, Connecticut, and I joined the church in 1988. And I became involved with the uh, Welcoming Church Congregation Committee uh, shortly after my daughter came out and I met with Frank Hall for the first time and he assured me that a, uh, the congregation, not only our congregation but our denomination had been very supportive of gay rights from at least the 1960s on. So I felt that I was probably in the right place to get some information and he also uh, introduced me to another congregant, Mickey Maggotson, who was a member of PFLAG, and shortly thereafter I joined PFLAG. Uh, parents, friends of lesbians and gays. And over the years that has become a lot more inclusive to include bi bisexuals and transgenders. And uh, be that encouraged me in, in many ways to become a member of, to, to want to work not only for educating myself, but also to uh, be supportive of my daughter and a, uh, to begin to advocate for, for the gay community as a whole because when you look around, yes, becoming more accepting as a parent, you suddenly see that society just isn't that com mm -hmm. comforting for anybody who is different of any kind of uh, ilk. Yeah. And I um, joined the church in 1988 after a long struggle of trying to find a religious community that I felt comfortable with. I came from a very Christian background and people were not accepting of my gay and lesbian friends among some of my other diverse friends. Um, I had a friend um, who tried to commit suicide and when he told his parents about it rather than them in, in, encouraging him to be who he was so he felt comfortable, they had him go to his priest and that just was devastating to him. And. Um, and I realized in my Christian background that where I was was just not comfortable for me. So I left the church for a very long time. I found out about the Unitarian Church and started coming there for various reasons. But I was still concerned about how accepting they were to other diverse populations, including gays and lesbians. So um, at that time, I didn't have a computer. So I did a little research. I called the UUA, asked them that, for some information, and I found back as back as not far as 1970, they passed at General Assembly a resolution to support gay and lesbian rights. So I was so happy to find um, a, a religious community that I felt comfortable with. And it's not only that they were supporting it, but they were making an outward stand about it too. And that's when I found out about the Westport Unitarian Church and then became connected. And then from there, we um, had a meeting with um, at Denny Davidoff's house, uh, I think it was a Saturday or a Sunday right. night, talking about um, a feedback about a meeting that Scott Alexander had at the church. And we talked about the diverse population and what we needed to do, and that's how we started um, forming the um, welcoming congregation at that time. That was uh, 1990? I, I believe it, it might have been around 1990. Was there any negative response to the church becoming a uh, a well a welcoming church there had been there had been some not at that point that I was aware of but later down the road uh, after the committee became uh, more active and we actually went through a program that came out of the uh, out, out of the UUA mm -hmm. came out yeah. of Boston and Scott Alexander was actually the editor of this uh, of this course that mm -hmm. a uh, 10 chapters I think it took us about 20 weeks to go through it at least mm -hmm. and uh, we started to hand out little questions and put them on the seats of the congregation some general little questions to get a feedback some of that feedback was a bit negative 
negative. Yeah, so at that time we didn't think the congregation was ready to right. have a congregational vote about becoming a welcoming congregation. Mm -hmm. We felt that we needed to spend a little more time finding out what the concerns were and um, how to make people feel more welcoming mm -hmm. about having a welcoming congregation. We did a survey at one time and some of the questions were very basic about how do you feel when you see a gay couple holding hands and some people right. at that time felt very negative about that oh, or yes. very uncomfortable. Um, so we spent a lot of time working and, and just trying to listen as well as give what, what we were learning and sharing with the church. We had a couple Sunday services. Yes, um, we did. That one was led by Marion Weisel and it was very informative and people came up to us, them afterwards and said, we, we never thought of these things. We never thought about the rights that gay people may lose, mm -hmm. you know, how they may be ostracized at work, for example, you know, if they come out and say, well, I'm gay. Um, so um, we spent a lot of time about it. Um, we, there was a march in, uh, I think it was 1994 or 93 in Washington, and we wanted to go to that march and we wanted to carry the church banner. So we had a, um, a meeting at the church to see if we could mm -hmm. carry that church banner. And I think there were maybe about seven people out of right. the whole congregation that didn't feel comfortable with it at that time. So then once we got that approval about the banner, we were like, okay, now <laughs> we're ready. We can start concentrating yeah. on getting that vote going forward. Exactly. And that's when we decided to hold it in 1994. Also, in a couple of the summers leading up to that, say about 92 or 93, mm -hmm. we started having a, a, a laylet service during the summer. And mm -hmm. a couple of the people in mm -hmm. our group, in our, on our committee, mm -hmm. would be uh, uh, highlighting their own experiences, mm -hmm. either personally or through their children or... Mm -hmm. So it yeah. was sort of easing into it. The mm -hmm. uh, congregation was becoming a little bit more attuned to it. And as John Tolley, our reverend, had said later on, that a, uh, it helped at that point in our journey that we had so many straight people on the committee. It made it easier than if mm -hmm. a uh, everybody had been predominantly gay and if the minister had been gay because people would have been afraid to raise questions. Yeah and, and I think Just that's that. one yeah. thing too that a lot of people question like all right you're a straight woman married to a man and you're a mother of a lesbian but mm -hmm. neither of you are a lesbian or gay or bisexual why is it so important to you and, and then they began to realize it's mm -hmm. important to us as, as mm -hmm. straight people to respect and to honor everyone in all different types of diversity and that's when other people started thinking about how would it affect their lives and the friends right. that they have too. So I think at first I felt uncomfortable that we didn't have a committee chair that wasn't gay, lesbian, or bisexual, mm -hmm. but people began to understand mm -hmm. why it was important to us. So And I met so many wonderful people. Oh yeah. I wouldn't yeah. go back on that at all. Yeah. I would be very disappointed if Louis said today, oh mom, I am not gay anymore. <laughs> and Shari and I have been were co chairs of this of this mm -hmm. committee after Joanna uh, Alling. Uh, Joanna yeah. Alling and Marion Weisel. Marion went off to actually to to Star King to become a to go into divinity school. Well, we always we were always fortunate that we had Frank Hall as our minister. They were doing uh, blessings, I think, he would call, I think, before yeah. they could actually use mm -hmm. the word mm -hmm. marriage. Blessings, a special ceremony. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he had been doing those mm -hmm. without even the congregation even being aware of yeah. it. Yeah. I am very glad that our committee is actively a, um, engaged in extending our to, to to question this whole transgender, bring the transgender a mm -hmm. uh, issue into the floor. And I'm so glad that Amy Rose from the Triangle Center is waking us up, and we are mm -hmm. able to do a lot. We will be just opening our arms a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're standing on the side of love in our own way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've been working with the transgender community. Yes. I think that's really important. Um, yeah. We've also um, helping with, with the gay, lesbian, um, bisexual youth. 
mm-hmm. and um, supporting the rain, their rainbow prom that they have in Stanford mm-hmm. every year. We've had a couple fundraisers and right. things like that. Yeah. We also um, are looking at um, going forward in the future as maybe working with Standing on the Side of Love because um, it's not only all about gay, lesbian, bisexual, um, civil rights, it's everyone's rights. And everyone, no matter what your sexual preference is or your, your background is, I mean, it's, it's very important to be diverse and to, to appreciate everyone for who they are and to show standing mm-hmm. in support for immigration and for civil rights. For, for um, Everyone should have food and everyone should have enough of an income that they can live in Connecticut. My name is Peter McKnight and I joined the Unitarian Church of Westport in 1997. I grew up Episcopalian and so I don't recall ever hearing of the Unitarian Church until I graduated from college and a friend of mine invited me up to Toronto and we stayed with a Unitarian minister in Mississauga and went to the service the next morning. And I remember a reading that still stays with me. He said, he drew a circle to shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle to bring him in. And so that planted the seed in me that I might be a Unitarian Universalist. Well, several years went by and I went to my uncle's funeral. And I didn't really feel comfortable with the message. So I said, I don't want this to be the message at my funeral. So maybe I ought to join that Unitarian church in Westport. So um, around that time, there were some folks that were um, reaching out to the lesbian and gay communities and from the church and saying, um, you know, we're a welcoming congregation. And I remember somebody coming up to me and giving me a, I think it was a brochure. And uh, so I said, that's another reason to join the church. So. I joined in 1997 and um, I've been coming ever since and um, it was two or three years ago when the Rainbow Task Force started to become more uh, active. I um, I was very happy to start coming to some of the meetings and the potlucks and I feel it's a really good group. It's very welcoming and um, makes me feel special to be part of this. So our role going forward, I believe, should be to, to make new folks welcome to, into the uh, church who might feel isolated otherwise, um, and also to set a good example for, for other faiths that may be struggling uh, with becoming welcoming congregations. Um, we've certainly, maybe if we weren't the first, we've been very good at it. For my, myself personally, I think we are doing an adequate job, um, but I'm certainly open to hearing what others um, may feel about that. I'm Denny Davidoff, and I started coming to the congregation in the fall of 1960. And uh, I actually signed the membership book in the spring of 1966, but right from the start. Uh, in 1960, uh, my late husband Jerry and I were very active in the congregation, and I remain active. Uh, we went to our first General Assembly, our Unitarian Universalist Association General Assembly, in June of 1968, at the suggestion of our then minister, Ed Lane. And it was a life-changing experience. Uh, for Jerry and for me, because we became very attuned to the variety of social justice issues that Unitarian Universalists all over the country were, uh, were beginning to shape and witness and be activists in. So in 1968, it was the issue of race, and voting rights and all of the work that had been raised up by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And in 1971, the emerging gay lesbian, I use the language of the time deliberately, uh, caucus within the UUA 
began to make its, itself known at General Assembly. The, uh, the, the people, both lay and clergy, who had come out as early as 1971-72 were allies of the uh, people who were fighting for racial equality. And so I remember very vividly any number of meetings at which uh, the gay folk asked the, uh, the racial equality folk to support their uh, quest for justice, just as we were doing for people of color. So uh, for me, my activities in support of, of GLBTQ goes back to June of 1971 when the General Assembly was uh, at the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. In those days, a General Assembly could fit in a hotel ballroom, not anymore. We now only fit in convention centers. Uh, as I progressed more and more as a UUA uh, activist and denominational figure of one kind or another, which began in 1973, when I was elected to the board of the Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation, these issues of, uh, uh, of equality for uh, lesbians and gays within our movement were, were part of my life. They weren't part of my life at the Unitarian Church in Westport, but they were part of my larger denominational life. And uh, eventually, I had to take notice of the fact that I was operating on one level within the UUA, and there was silence on, at the Unitarian Church in Westport regarding the issue of gay rights. In the late 80s, I remember talking to uh, Mickey Mag Magidson and Sonny Kajafi, who was on the church board at the time, Sonny was, and uh, Mary Castrina, all of whom had daughters who had come out as lesbians. And uh, I remember in particular my conversations uh, with Mickey simply because I knew Mickey better than the, than the other women. And she had become very active in PFLAG. And meanwhile, year after year after year, the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly was passing resolutions uh, about marriage equality, uh, initially civil unions, recognizing uh, a bisexuality, uh, 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 providing cover, official cover, for our ordained clergy to perform, to perform uh, civil unions. Uh, and, and people all over the country, Unitarian Universalists, were allies in one state or large metropolitan community after another in the pursuit of, of, of rights for what was becoming the GLBTQ uh, Q community, ever increasing in, uh, in our faith movement because we very early on uh, uh, ordained and accepted into fellowship within the Unitarian Universalist movement uh, gay and lesbian ministers. We were very, very, very early in that. I would come back from a General Assembly energized about these issues and, and find this distressing silence uh, here in Westport at, uh, uh, at, 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 the, at the congregation, and indeed in every congregation in Westport. It just wasn't the Unitarian Universalists. In 1989, the General Assembly was held at Yale University. And 
I was at that time uh, the chair of the General Assembly Planning Committee, and uh, that was my last of four years on the General Assembly Planning Committee. And at that 1989 GA, I was uh, elected to the Board of Trustees of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And we came home, the GA is always in late June, in the, 34th, the third or fourth week of June. And we came home and I had already accepted an invitation from whoever was running the summer services uh, in those days to do a service in August. I did a sermon about my distress concerning the lack of recognition of the gay and lesbian and bisexual, again, I use the terms of the times, community uh, in our congregation or in, in, as far as I knew, any other congregation in Westport. And I remember uh, talking in my sermon, uh, making fun of the fact that it seemed odd to me that we seem to be the only community in the United States that, oddly enough, no gay people lived in. Uh, it, it must be so, because if there were gay people in the community, they would be in the congregation. And of course, I was talking about the fact that we were not welcoming, and it, it was not a safe uh, faith community to come out in. I think that in 1990, I followed uh, Ted Beers as board chair in our church. And Ted had been to that uh, General Assembly in Yale, and he was very energized as a straight man around these, around these issues. And by that time, the Unitarian Universalist Association had uh, published the Welcoming Congregation handbook, curriculum, if you will, that, uh, uh, that a um, congregation could uh, attend to, follow, and uh, in the hopes of becoming certified as a welcoming congregation within the Unitarian Universalist Association. And I don't remember all the details, but I vividly remember that Ted Beers and I and and I know Mickey Magidson was there, and possibly Sonny, uh, had a meeting with Frank Hall to ask him if he would, as our, as our senior minister and at the time our only minister, if he would support this endeavor. Uh, and, and of course he agreed to do that, and did. Um, so we went through the whole process of becoming a welcoming congregation. I think it took uh, the better part of a year. It required educating uh, people in the congregation, educating the board, uh, understanding what it would mean uh, to be a safe space for people uh, to come out in. And out of that early effort, and somewhere between 1989 and I would say 1992, was born what is today the Rainbow Task Force. I am still very, very involved in the Unitarian Universalist movement. I went on uh, to become the presiding officer, the moderator of the association uh, from 1993 to 2001. And in all of those eight years, the swell of, of, of witness for uh, LGBTQ uh, rights uh, has uh, become more and more prevalent in, in the association. And there are uh, an enormous number of ordained ministers who are lesbian and gay and trans. And I know a lot of them. They are, uh, they are dear friends of mine. 
and we have done a lot of history making together. Today, I uh, am a consultant for fundraising for Meadville Lombard Theological School, and I'm pleased to say that we have uh, trans people who are currently students at Meadville Lombard, and uh, the faculty uh, is straight and, and, and gay, and the administration is, and it's just uh, that my life is, is normal around issues of the rights of all people to love who they want to love and be who they not only want to be, but in fact are. I'm Marion Weisel. I was a member of the Westport congregation for many years. Felt the call to ministry in that congregation. Uh, went to Star King School for the ministry in 1995. Graduated in 1998. Was ordained in Westport, I believe it was in 2000. And served in Westport as a community minister for a number of years. Uh, left Westport and went back to the Unitarian Society of New Haven, not as somebody who attended there, but as an assistant minister and then as a called associate. When I came to Westport, uh, after I started talking to folks in the congregation and they heard where I came from and what I had been involved in in Hamden, uh, I was quickly recruited to the Welcoming Congregation Committee, although I'm not sure it was a committee at that point. It might have been a task force or something. Um, we gathered as a group and talked about strategies and where Westport was in the process. And I believe that Frank Hall was on sabbatical at the time. Uh, so we met as a group for a number of months. Uh, I remember meeting with some folks in the congregation who were in leadership positions and who rightly had some questions and concerns about the process for the congregation. I remember Diana Bell was one of those people. And uh, she was uh, possibly uh, on the board at the time. And I remember she asked insightful and good questions that helped us as individuals and as a committee um, begin to better articulate um, really our message to individuals in the congregation and to the congregation as a whole. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've, I've told this story to Diana, so I feel comfortable telling it here. Whenever I feel that I have something difficult to communicate to a group or to a congregation, I picture everyone as Diana Bell because I felt that she came to that meeting with her questions and her concerns, but an open heart and an open mind. And I think that's the best we can ask for in a congregation or among anyone, really. When I came to the Westport congregation, people would tell me that there were no out gay, lesbians, bisexual, transgender folks in the congregation. And I would tell them, well, really, there are a lot of gay folks here, including myself, and um, Perhaps they need more encouragement to be more visible in the congregation by making sure that they're in a safe place to be out. Uh, when Frank Hall returned from his sabbatical, we were ready as a group, uh, the Welcoming Congregation Committee, to go to him and to let him know what we needed from him, which was his support uh, with our effort both on a congregational level and really specifically from the pulpit. 
and that he generously gave. It's interesting to me, as someone who became an ordained minister, that uh, that really the beginning of the process in Westport is what I remember most. I don't remember a congregational vote. I don't remember a celebration afterwards, which I'm sure at least the welcoming congregation committee had. Um, and I think that's true for me because this process was really fundamental to me as, you know, my call to ministry. It wasn't all of my call to ministry, but that process was really important to me in kind of seeing both sides of it from the congregation's perspective, but also from an individual who was going to be affected by how open and welcoming a congregation was to somebody who's gay, lesbian, transgendered, bisexual. I remember at one point we, you know, went and met with Denny Davidoff and Jerry probably was there as well, and um, talked with Denny and Jerry about the denominational effort and what was happening there. And we talked as a group, as a whole group, about um, our next steps in Westport and really a strategy um, for us as the Welcoming Congregation Committee and how we might go forward. Hello, my name is Suzanne Sheridan. I am a lesbian and married to Roseanne Gates, who is also a lesbian. We both joined the Unitarian Church in Westport be after they became a welcoming church. And we had heard through many of the people on the Rainbow Task Force, which used to be called the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Task Force, about the process, but we personally did not take part in it. Because we're not physically visible, it's more important that there be a welcoming church concept so that we as lesbians, gays, bisexuals, and transgenders know that we are welcomed. Let me put it this way. Because we do not have any phenotype or physical way that people can tell that we're gay, so we have no color, or if we were all lilac, for example, then people would know that we were gay, but there's no way to tell. So for that reason alone, it's very important that people know that they are welcomed and that the welcoming church process was very important for gay people so that we know that we are welcomed in the church. Um, because before that happened, there were many, many people who were gay who never told anybody that they were gay couples. So people didn't know that they were gay, but they were and they were there. It's just that they didn't come out. So Rosie and I came to the church around 1996, 97, when we moved to Westport. Um, I had been a member of a different church and uh, we decided to try out the Unitarian Church. And we were very glad we did because we felt there were a lot of forward-thinking people there, and we were extremely welcomed. I mean, it was over-the-top welcomed, and it made us feel great and, and gave us the opportunity to mature and develop as a couple in ways that we might not have had we not been in this congregation. We felt like they gave us wings. They allowed us to become the people that we really were, both in our relationship and outside our relationship. And we were actually, um, in 2005, we had a civil union ceremony, which was done. We, we looked at each other and we said, we're not going to do a civil union until it's legal. And as soon as it became legal, we married and we had 300 of our closest friends in attendance at our beautiful wedding ceremony. And it morphed into a marriage legally a few years later which we were very grateful for also. And we were the first ones there at the town hall with um, Patty, Patty Strauss was there. And we got our marriage certificate and 
It was really incredible. The experience was almost overwhelming in its blessing to us as a couple. Uh, now we actually do our taxes together like real adult people. And uh, this is true not only in the state of Connecticut, but federally. So we've come a long, long way, and it would not have been possible if we didn't have these little steps along the way, the church's steps to become a welcoming church, the ability to have a civil union, the, the kind of pressuring that we did on our legislature to allow the state of Connecticut to allow marriage. And we had always seen that marriage equality was the end result that we wanted. So our church was an incredible blessing to us. Uh, I don't know what our lives would be like without it. And we give thanks to Joanna Alling and San, uh, Sunny Kajavi and all of the people who were part of that initial committee uh, to create a welcoming church because it couldn't have been easy, but it was so, so, so important. And here we are in 2014, and we had no idea how far we would be able to come. So it was because of this, these steps, all in the right direction. And I can say that our church were the, the ministers that went to New Paltz when New Paltz allowed marriages. Uh, the mayor couldn't do them all himself, and, all, and Barbara Fast and... Frank Hall, and they married us, by the way, Barbara Fast and Frank Hall. And Deborah Hafner also went to New Paltz. And she's been very, very support, supportive all the way through as well. And gosh, there's so much love in our congregation for us. Um, the process that we are aware of is the one that happened after we became a welcoming church, but before we became uh, civil unions were available for, for people like us. And uh, I can say that there was, there was lively discussion. Uh, very few people were against it. I can't remember anybody who was against it. There was a difference in belief about how long it would take. And some people thought it would take 10 years. Some people thought we should have it now. But I remember one day Frank turned to me and Rosie and said, what is it that you want? And I said, we want what you guys have, the ability to marry the person you love and to live the life that you want to live with that person. And for that, he really got it. He got it. He's always been there for us. And I'm just very, very grateful to the process and to our church. And I would say that this is a great church if you're a gay person or a transgender person to come to because... There is an understanding of the social justice elements involved in this in today's world. I believe that the Rainbow Task Force, as it exists, is a very important part of what the Unitarian Church stands for. And we are going to, it looks like, we're going to be moving toward coalition with uh, standing on the side of love. Because we see the, the gay fight for justice as something that is similar, if not identical, to immigration reform, uh, racial reform, overcoming racial stereotyping, uh, transgender reform. They're all civil rights that need to be addressed. So in the coming years, our uh, focus will be to align with these groups because we're all in this love together. We're all in it together. We have the same issues that they have. It's just that uh, our next steps might be to see ourselves in relation to other similar civil rights issues, but also to finally get the United States as a whole to recognize marriage equality in every state. I think that is the most important thing that we could do moving ahead because now we have a patchwork quilt of states that say yes you guys have a right to be and we have what is it 38 37 states now it keeps the numbers keep going down in the right direction which is good 
but the efforts on the other side are, are incredibly strong. So we need to come about in a determined way to get marriage equality in every single state of, of the union, every state, so that if we decide to move from our beautiful state of Connecticut, we will also have our legal status respected and understood, and we don't have to go through this again in another state. So that's where I think we should put our attention, because yes, we are incredibly successful, but there are states where people have no rights, and that makes me very sad. It makes my heart break, and I think that we need to help them. We need to spend our energies helping the states that haven't got it as, as together as we do. And that's about it. Signing off. Well, first of all, thanks for doing this. Uh, it's a piece of history, the welcoming congregation uh, effort that I was part of, but only peripherally, and I'll talk about that. But first, uh, I want to talk about my own experience um, that goes back 43 years when I started in ministry. In my first year of seminary, I was uh, hired to be an assistant to the minister in Lexington, Massachusetts, in one of the two Unitarian churches there, named for Charles Fallen, the first professor of German at Harvard, uh, who became a Unitarian minister under the influence of William Ellery Channing, which is basic to our history. Um, and in 1970-71, the curriculum about your sexuality, called it AYS, was being developed. And the congregation that I was serving in Lexington was asked to be one of the pilots to try out this material that was being produced. Um, and it was very, a very daring step at the time in terms of teaching about your sexuality. And it broke down the barriers and removed the stick figures and the biology lessons and got at the whole question of sexuality. And not only as an act in terms of sex, but in terms of one's whole life. It's interesting that the curriculum was later changed. The name was changed to Our Whole Lives. Owl, it's called. So I was part of the pilot program. One thing led to another, and I got trained to be a teacher of the material, and also later trained to, to train teachers uh, to use the material. So that was 1970, 71, 72. And I was later called to the church in Attleboro in 1972 when I got out of seminary and I was of course still using that material. My own children went through the AYS About Your Sexuality curriculum and my wife Anita then my wife and I were the teachers and our as I say our two children Susan and Jonathan who are now 46 and 50 years old um, went through that program uh, in Attleboro. And early on, I went to Attleboro in 1972, a new curriculum was introduced called The Invisible Minority. And it was, as the title suggests, about the lives of gay, lesbian people who were still basically, in general, out of the closet. I mean, in the closet. And this was a whole attempt to uh, help people in general deal with the gay lesbian issues and questions and the whole thing of people being quiet and not talking about it. And I remember early on when I was teaching the Invisible Minority Curriculum, I invited people in the community to come and join in the conversation. And I put an ad in the local paper. And I was surprised and very pleased that 
a number of people from the community showed up. And there was an incident where one of the members of our congregation, uh, I remember Harriet Small, her name was, she long, long since have died, and she said how much she was excited about this uh, material. She, she said, because, you know, I've never met a homosexual person. And one of the men who had shown up from the community answering the invitation looked at her and said, oh, yes, you have, honey. And she said, well, do you mean? And it was, it was a little microcosm of what the whole thing is about of being out and being real and being yourself. And these men explained to her that there was a very active homosexual community, but it was quiet. And he even said, I'll never forget, he said, we've been keeping to ourselves, but you've invited us to come out, to be here with you. And that's what the welcoming congregation effort was designed to do. Now, the curriculum, for the uh, material to help congregations become welcoming congregations was initiated in 1989 at the General Assembly passing a resolution and in 1991 to uh, make that resolution more than just words on a page and forget about it after it's done, there was a curriculum developed called the Welcoming Congregation in 1991. and. Um, we were one of the first congregations to use the material and to do what they told us we needed to do to actually be a welcoming congregation. In those days, people would say, well, of course, we welcome anybody. And it was somewhat patronizing because to really be welcoming, you need to make an intentional effort. And there are things you have to do. There are things, for example, that when somebody walks into the building on a Sunday morning, say, to visit, what's on the bulletin boards? What tells them that you are a welcoming? What's being said from the pulpit? What's being said from lay-led announcements? Is there any indication that you are really welcome in this congregation? So we went through the process and we got certified in 1994. We had done what they had said. And in a way, that ending was a beginning. It was a new beginning. We had become aware on a deep level, number one, that you need to be intentional about welcoming, and number two, that it's difficult for people on both sides of the question. For example, several parents of children who had grown up in our congregation came and talked with me and others about coming out, about having a gay or lesbian son or daughter. And that became a very important piece of the project for them, very real. And walking through that process, it almost seems like ancient history now. Things have changed quite a bit and for the better. But one of the things that I think of in the 20th anniversary of this effort is that we still have a long way to go. We live in a small world. And when you read about um, the gay, lesbian oppression in Africa and among various groups around the world, uh, it's somewhat reactionary, um, but it's also an indication of what has been the the life of gay, lesbian people having to hide, afraid for their lives, afraid for their relationships on a personal level with parents and siblings. Um, so the effort was really far-reaching, much more than any of us could have imagined uh, to begin with. and. I'm just very pleased to have the opportunity not only to do this in terms of an interview, but for me personally to think about what I went through. Um, for example, in 1984, 
when I was called to serve the congregation in Westport at the General Assembly in Columbus, Ohio, that summer, I was to start August 15th, and this was in June, a resolution was passed in support of clergy who were doing union ceremonies, who were in a sense blessing marriages, um, which couldn't be legal. And that summer, there was an article in the Westport News about the General Assembly resolution. And it was sort of far-reaching. It was saying, you know, this resolution was passed in support of clergy doing ceremonies. And so I started getting calls. The first one call I got um, before I had done my first Sunday service um, was from two lesbians who had been together for over 30 years. And one of them, as it turns out, was terminally ill. They were both in their mid-late 60s. And they asked me if I would do a ceremony and bless their union. And at Christmas time, I remember, we went down into the chapel uh, downstairs in the church because it was a small group. There were maybe 25 family members friends and how important it was for them after all this time. And they g gave me a poem to read at that service. And I'll never forget it. Uh, I'll never forget the sense of connection between these two women, as loving as anybody could ever be. And the poem from Sarah Teasdale said, you had only to open the door to bring me the self I was before. I thought I should never see her again. I thought she was hidden from women and men. Her eyes had been bright as the sun on water. She sang as blithe as an elf king's daughter. I had hoped, and then I had stopped hoping. And the years ran downward still and sloping. But on that October night I knew the self I was came back with you. Now, nothing in my experience could express the process better, not only between those two people, but the open, opening line, you had only to open the door. Somebody has to open the door. That's what the welcoming congregation effort is about. Bottom line, opening the door and being welcome to Help somebody be real. You can't uh, do that for them, but you can open the door and you can be intentional about being welcoming. And that is an effort of many people. I had an influence, but I was not directly involved in doing the organizational work of the welcoming congregation. I know that I was an inspiration, or I was doing my work as a minister, and I was doing more and more gay-lesbian unions. Um, and there were a few couples for whom I did a ceremony of commitment, and then it became legal with a civil ceremony in Connecticut. And then they came back and said, we want the legal part, so I did civil ceremonies. And then Lo and behold, Connecticut was one of the first to have legal marriage with all the rights and privileges. And that's the real, that's the, the nub of the, the marriage thing versus civil unions or whatever, the second class relationships. Um, and so there were some for whom I did all three ceremonies. And then one of the big moments for me and it relates to what we're talking about, uh, was when Roseanne and Suzanne came down the aisle and Barbara and I were officiating, Barbara Fast and I, at the ceremony. And, and it took a long time in terms of the ceremony to make that walk down the aisle. And I said, well, it's taken you a long time to get, get to this point. And I said, that's because it took us a long time to get here. And we are at a good place, but we have more work to do. Um, 
And I'm glad to be part of the conversation that's going on. And hopefully this uh, celebration will not only allow us to remember what we did to get here, but it will give us some direction for the future and where we have to go now and what we have to do to continue to be welcoming, but also to reach beyond the confines of our own congregation and move forward. Thank you. Refugee.